and you can go ahead and get started. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gerard Lockhart. I'm from the mayor's office for people with disabilities. Um, welcome to disability awareness training uh, presented by the mayor's office for people with disabilities. Uh, first of all, I want to like to give a visual description to provide space for individuals who may be listening or may be blind or have a visual impairment. I just want to provide space for those people. Um, also, I would like to uh, give a visual description. So I'm an African American male. Um, I'm in my office. I actually have, uh, I wear glasses. I am a blue, a gray collared shirt. And actually behind me in my office is a, uh, is a photo of two blonde Korean uh, judo wrestlers from the 20, the Beijing Olympics in 2018. So disability awareness training is a starting point rather than a comprehensive guide. This training is the same training, similar training that we give to all people who work with the general public, regardless if they work with people with or without disabilities. So this training, I've personally given this training, um, I've been at MOPD for the last two decades. So I've trained everybody from the, the CTA, uh, Chicago Police Department, including the recruits, the fire department, including the cadets, uh, city of Chicago uh, departments from the Department of Cultural Affairs, Chicago Public Library, everybody, the sister agencies, everybody that works in the public, the general public with disability awareness training. Um, so here's a quick outline. Now, now you're gonna have an opportunity to look at the PowerPoint slides individually. Uh, I don't go through each slide verbatim, I just scan, and so just remember, you can refer back uh, to each slide if you need to. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an introduction on what we do at MOPD. We're gonna talk about some statistics and the prevalence of people with disabilities. Then we're gonna talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. That is why we are here. Another thing, a big topic is awareness and etiquette. First person language, terminology, but then we're going to talk about tips for communication and access based on specific type of disabilities as far as people who are blind or have low vision. Uh, we talk about the service animal policy. That's important for businesses to know. Uh, we'll talk about the deaf and hard of hearing, hearing community, which is a very large and vocal community in the city of Chicago. We will also talk about how to interact with people with mobility impairments, people with, in, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Then we're going to talk about Chicago access officer, access officers. And as a bonus, I added information on how to make virtual meetings accessible. Uh, your host and I, we were speaking before we started on how to make virtual meetings accessible. And one way we do that is by providing uh, visual descriptions as uh, for people who are blind or visually impaired, uh, providing interpreters, providing live transcription or cart service. And I'll talk about that as we go on to make meetings, virtual meetings accessible. Our Chicago access officers portion of the program, that is someone, that's an initiative that we started last year during the Americans with Disabilities Act July 26th, uh, anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the Chicago Access Officers are a person at the deputy level and above who is designated for each department to be responsible for procuring the accessibility needs for individuals who seek programs and services from their department. <laughs> so <laughs> the Department of Procurers has an access officer, the Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection has an access officer and so on. All right, so MOPD's goal is to make Chicago a world-class disability-friendly city and to foster accessibility 
full participation and equal access for people with disabilities. And our mission is through systemic change, information and referral, education and training, public policy, and direct services. Just to talk about that in detail, we work with people age 59 and under who primarily live, live in the city of Chicago. We have a few programs where we work with people who live in the state of Illinois or in the greater Chicago land. I mean, Cook County, Chicago land, Northwest Indiana re region. That would be our work, workforce incentives program and our amplified phone program. But pretty much you have to be the age of 59 and under to receive our services. Uh, we have homemaker services or uh, personal assistance services, which is the more politi politically correct term, which is part of our independent living program. Where we can provide assistive technology and devices so people can be independent at home. We have a home modification program. We have a senior policy analyst that deals with public policy to make sure it addresses the needs of people with disabilities. We have an accessibility compliance unit who works with the building department. And they make sure that all new construction and major renovations uh, have a accessibility permit. So you can't continue with construction unless you receive a permit. Uh, in the building department, they have water, electrical, HVAC. And also now, we, we were the first departments to have that. Uh, we have an accessibility permit. And we have other programs and other initiatives that uh, you can always visit us at cityofchicago.org slash disabilities. So here's some statistics. Basically, uh, these statistics talk about the number of people with disabilities. There are over 800,000 in the Chicagoland area, which includes the seven color counties. There's 67% of people with disabilities who are people of color. There are 57,000 students with disabilities. And the purchasing power, which will be interest to you and your organization or company, would be the almost 500 billion amount of estimated purchasing power that people with disabilities have. Prevalence of, of disabilities. There are uh, 61 million people living with at least one disability. So if you think about it, uh, one in five, one in five people have uh, disabilities, right? If they're like 300 million people in the United States, 61 million people, that's one in five persons with a disability, 26%. And the majority of those disabilities are hidden or invisible, non-apparent disabilities. So we'll talk about like there are actually 200 different categories of disabilities, but most of them are non-apparent or invisible. Now. This graphic talks about that there, like mentions 40% of adults age 65 and plus have a disability. This is because the advance of the advances in medicine and uh, medical technology, people are living longer. But I like to say age is nothing but a number because I know people who are age 60. I used to say 40, 50, and 60, but now I'm 50. I'm going to start at 60, 70, and 80 who are younger, who are healthier than people one third their age. So age is nothing but a number. You have to have a disability. I'm going to go over the definition of, of the Americans with Disabilities Act definition of a disability. So the, a, the Americans with Disabilities Act, you may hear me mention ADA, but that's, that's the ADA for short. ADA stands for Americans with Disabilities Act. So the definition is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of, of life's major activities. Okay, what's the major life activities? I'm going to talk about that in different slides, but basically walking, talking, hearing, the ability to have self-care, communicate, hearing. That's a sensory disability. But the other two uh, definitions, the parts of the definitions can be a little ambiguous. A person who has a history or record of such an impairment. What does that mean? That means in the past, you could have had a disability. You could have had a diagnosis of cancer, but it's a remission. You could have had some condition that uh, made you temporary, dis temporarily disabled. But if you overcome, not overcome that, but if you sojourn through that, 
but you still have a medical record of that, then you're protected under the law. So the Americans with Disabilities Act is, is a civil rights act, and it gives you uh, protections under the, the act. So the ADA was signed in 1990, but it was patterned after the Civil Rights Act of 1965. So it's a civil rights act that was extended to people with disabilities. It was the first major civil rights act extended extended for people with disabilities. I know we had the Rehabilitation Act, I think it was in 73, but that was dealing with federal funded agencies and buildings. The last part of that definition is a person perceived by others as having such an impairment. What does that mean? Let's say you're not disabled, you don't have a disability, but people make an assumption and they make they assume that you have a disability. Well, and if they and they treat you as if you have a disability, they may assume you have HIV or COVID or you have some deformity, and they think that your physical or mental that they think that it substantially limits one or more life activities, and they discriminate against you based on that, then you're protected under the law. That that's what perceived you. If you don't have a disability. Your roommate have a disability and they assume that you have a disability, that means you're protected under the law. So at on your own time, I want you to definitely look over the different types of major life activities. I'm just going to point out a couple of ones that are invisible, endocrinological functions, immune functions, respiratory functions. You can't see these in individuals. You can't identify them unless someone discloses them until you they're invisible. Types of disabilities, the same thing. These have names, but orthopedic, HIV, AIDS, diabetes, cancer, alcoholism. You don't know. You can't tell. Those those disabilities are non-apparent. But you know, there are over 200 different types of disabilities. So the ADA, uh, we talked about this, uh how it was signed into law by George Herbert Walker Bush in 1990. That's when our department was founded, after the signing of the ADA. So our department has been around since 1990. <laughs> the ADA has five titles. Title one deals with employment, meaning your human resources department, then the subject matter experts when it comes to title one, dealing with employment. Uh, they provide, like if you have more than 15 or more employees, you have to provide reasonable reasonable accommodations for your employees with disabilities. Uh, so that deals with Title I. Title II deals with the city of Chicago. We're a state local government program, local government. That means we have to provide uh, equal access for people with disabilities for all of our services. Public accommodations, I highlighted it because this pertains to public, the private sector, uh, business owners, Telecommunications deals with telephone access for the deaf or hard of hearing. Uh, that would be people. That's why we have 711 relay services. That's why we have closed captioning on television shows. Title IV is kind of miscellaneous. It deals with retaliation and catches other uh, provisions. So public accommodations, um, I talked about that. Uh, that. That deals with the private sector private clubs, and they're like uh, restaurants, eating establishments. They're like 12 different uh, exhibits and places of lodging from hotels, movie theaters, service establishments, education establishments. So any business and tourism, any company that offers services to the public has to provide accessibility to all members of the public, regardless their disability. And uh, I'll go into more detail that you can read at your leisure if you want to uh, know the different 12 categories, why you would need to modify your uh, establishment to accommodate people with disabilities. This talks about removing architectural barriers in existing buildings and newly built or altered facilities. That's why we, at our department, 
if you're going to do any major innovations or reconstructions, we do permit plan reviews or prepare permit plan reviews. So we can look at your plans. We have architects and building inspectors that can provide recommendations on how to make your building accessible. But the major reason why I'm here is the greatest challenge that people with disabilities face are not necessarily architectural barriers, it will be attitudinal barriers when quote unquote able-bodied people treat them differently. We want you to treat people with disabilities the same way you treat everybody else. Okay? Treat people with disabilities like people. So public accommodations and reasonable modifications. A reasonable modification on slide 17 deals with like how do you change your policies and make adjustments for people with disabilities. You can allow extra snacks for individuals with diabetes. You may have a policy saying no food allowed. If someone has to take medication, let them bring water. Uh, you know, if you're in the education program and people have information processing delays, then they may request extra time to take uh, tests, reading product labels and instructions. So someone may ask you to read something to them. English can be a second language. They can have dyslexia or they can have low vision. Retrieving merchandise from high shelves. So these are the things where you can provide a modification. Menus, I'm gonna talk about menus because I know after COVID we started using QR codes, but that's not accessible for people who are blind or visually impaired. But here's some barrier removal tips. Staff training, you can book uh, training with me and I can provide uh, disability awareness training to your staff if you would like to have that. And there are tax credits for people who remove uh, barriers and make, and make their facility accessible. Okay, awareness and etiquette. Best practice is person first language. People first language means use a person with a disability, a person who is blind, not disabled person or blind person. Use the person first language. That means you respect their individuality or their disability. Now there's something called identity first language, which means, which means ask the person how they want to be identified. Some people want to be identified uh, by their disability first, that's up to them, but ask them first. And use the term the individual uses. If you don't know, use people first. Well, I have something better than that. What is the most universal term you should use to refer to people with disabilities by? And it's the best term. And it's also a term or word that can be understood in everybody's language and spoken. The individual's name. If you don't know their name, ask them or just refer to them as sir, as sir or ma'am, or they or it. Words to retire. Handicap. If you refer to people with disabilities as handicapped, I don't know if you can see this, but I'm holding the cap in my hand. You're referring to people, this term handicap <laughs> refers to people who stood on street corners and begged for money. I don't know why in modern times, this was back during World War I. They didn't have a veterans administration. So the veterans would just have a cap in hand bad for money. I don't know why a modern term is used to refer to people with disabilities as being handicapped because unconsciously, what are you saying about people with disabilities? Because it has nothing to do with their social economic status. You're saying that they're the deficit of society, always looking for a handout. So we want you to eliminate, eliminate the word handicap from, from your vocabulary. The universal accessibility symbol has a wheelchair in a circle encircling a wheelchair, it's a diet, it's a figure. That stands for the accessibility symbol. Also words to retire would be special needs, differently able. Which words to use instead? Use accessible, accessible parking. I mean, we refer to people, use their name. That's the best word. But when it comes to parking or restroom, this should put accessible in front of it. And we all have special needs. And I know there's a special Olympics, but you don't need to add special or these other terms that I added. I'm not, it's a whole list of terms, 
that you should retire, even terms of endearment. No, we want you to treat people with disabilities like people and refer to them the same way you refer to everybody else. Okay, let's talk about tips for communication. Now, this can deal with people who are blind, visually impaired, people that have auditory disabilities who are deaf or hard of hearing, or people with speech impairments, right? So if you communicate, if someone has a, a let's say they have a personal assistant or a friend with them, don't communicate through the friend or an interpreter. Don't communicate through the interpreter Act like the friend or interpreter is not there and communicate directly with the person with the disability. And sometimes it's, I know it's hard if, if somebody's an interpreter for this individual, um, but look at the person you're, uh, you're communicating with. And don't speak through the person. And lastly, uh, it, it talks about if you met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability and be receptive to the individual's communication and navigation needs. What that slide means, or that sentence means is, everybody's individually different. You can have three blind people sit at a table and they can all have different needs. So don't assume that if you know accommodation that worked for one person, that it's gonna work for another person. For instance, some blind people read Braille, other blind people don't read, read their Braille. Some people who are deaf know sign language. Other people who are deaf or became deaf later in life don't know sign language. So don't make that assumption that one accommodation is going to fit everybody. Everybody's unique. Okay, so avoid inspirational porn. That means if you see somebody with a disability, don't just give them praise for doing stuff that everybody does on an ongoing basis. So think about that, meaning, oh, you're so amazing that you're traveling by yourself. I mean, you wouldn't say that to people who are non-disabled, so don't say it to people with disabilities. And also don't say or mention people overcome a disability. The correct term is have a disability or live with a disability. Because in the past, we followed a medical model of disability, meaning we're gonna give you treatment and try to find a cure to fix you. Now we have the social model of disability, meaning the onus is on society to change, not the individual, because the individual can have a disability and live with a disability for the rest of their life, and there's nothing wrong with, it, with that. They don't need to be fixed. They can have a, they can live and thrive with their disability. Communication tips: Give individuals your full attention. Let's say you need to communicate somebody with somebody with a speech impairment, somebody that's uh, deaf or hard of hearing and it's hard for you to understand their language, or somebody with a developmental disability. Well, you need to have patience. If someone has a speech impairment, give them time to respond. Don't try to answer for them and confirm that you understand. Either provide a yes or a no questions or answers, or let them point at different things if this person is visual. Also, don't raise your voice. It's good just to answer, ask yes or no questions or pass notes to the individual. But if the individual is blind or have low vision, of course, notes wouldn't be in use. You would use, you know, audible, you would use your voice. And there are different degrees of blindness. There are people who are blind or legally blind that can see. Uh, so there's some people who use service animals. There's some people who don't. There's some people who use canes, but people who don't. You may not know unless they self-disclose their disability. So if you work with somebody you happen to know who is blind, or if, some, if you encounter somebody that's blind or have a visual impairment, the first thing you should do is communicate to them. Identify yourself by introducing yourself. They're going to know. And let them know where they work. In this example, where you're working, in this example, uh, I'm going to read it. It says, hi, I'm Jessica. I'm the director of visitor services here at the park. This way, the person is going to know that they're talking to somebody that works here and they're going to know, hey, I made it to the right destination, I made it to the park, if that's where they wanted to go. Now, if you need to provide, uh, if you need to escort somebody that's blind or visually impaired around, 
the term is called wayfinding assistance. Always ask first. Don't assume because everybody's different. Um, always ask how they would like to be assisted. Go on the other side of their, uh, let's say they have an assistive device such as a cane or a service animal. Walk on the other side of their service animal. And you stick your arm out and ask them, how would you like for me to guide you? Would you like to grab my arm, hand, or elbow? Would you like for me to grab yours? Everybody's different. So let them tell you how they want to be uh, escorted. And then when you are walking with this person, give them directional assistance, meaning use the clock cues instead of left or right. In your direction of travel, you need to say 12, 3, behind you is 6, to your left is 9 or 12 o'clock. So you give directional cues and make sure to point out any protruding objects. I know at City Hall we have like <laughs> pay phones, uh, defibrillator devices, tourniquet devices that protrude from the wall. And if they're more than 27 inches above the floor, they are not cane detectable. An individual can bump into them. If they're lower than 80 inches from the ceiling, you can cause a head injury. Typically, that would be staircases or, you know, a lot of TV monitors that are wall mounted. They can be protruding objects. So just be aware of that. So, so if you are at an event um, or you're giving written information to the public, then provide alternative formats. <laughs> a cheap, a relatively inexpensive, inexpensive alternative format would be something like something written on black and white paper. White paper, black ink, something that's large enough in 18 point that's double spaced in a nice uh, font like area. Individuals with low vision can read that on the magnifying device. I know menus and uh, pamphlets that have shiny, glossy materials can be, uh, have a glare and it can be hard to read. If you add an event or program, you may have to provide an audio description where people are describing each event or each scene. Um, if you have YouTube, not YouTube, but uh, Netflix and Hulu, some movies have audio descriptions and you hear a voice that uh, describes each scene in the background. AMC movie theaters, you can request uh, audio description. Uh, you, get, you can request an assistive listening device where it transmits the, uh, the description of the scene to your headphones or hearing aid and have somebody describe the scenes. Uh, for virtual meetings, uh, you can send information ahead of time so individuals can use their assistive technology and then you provide assistive, uh, you can provide visual descriptions of the speakers like I did. Um, and also be conscious of the chat use, that's not accessible for people with disabilities. And that says Zoom, but it's like that on Teams and on WebEx. So if you have, a, and I'm going to talk about virtual meetings, uh, you need to maybe have someone that can read the chat, read the polls that you use, because they're not really accessible on virtual meetings. Service animals. Service animals are not a pet. So if you see, if you put up a sign that says no, no pets allowed, well, people can bring service animals. 99 point. 5% of the time you'll see a dog, but we don't call them or refer to them as seeing eye, eye dogs, they're service animals. These animals are highly trained uh, to provide uh, service as far as, they're not just for people who are blind or visually impaired, it's for people with epilepsy, people with uh, PTSD, depression, or they help with balance issues. Now, sometimes they have miniature horses, but I haven't seen any in Chicago. So you're going to have dogs, but if you suspect somebody doesn't have a, uh, a service animal is not real and they're just like kind of faking it, then you're only allowed to ask two questions. The first question, and this was recommended <coughs> by the United States Department of Justice. First question is: is, a, is the dog or service animal required because of a disability? And the second question is: What work or task has a dog been trained to perform? Uh, there, those are the only two questions you can ask. The, ana the service animals do not have to have documentation. They do not have to have a harness or vest or ID. You can't ask for that. 
And we don't want you to have the individual disclose what their disability is, because that's HIPAA private health information. So just ask those two questions. And if you don't believe them, you know, you can tell a service animal from uh, a pet because a service animal will sit there like a piece of furniture. You won't even know that they're there. Uh, now, the owner is responsible for the animal. If it's disrupting um, your establishment and making noises or threatening people, not a subjective threat, but actually threatening people, then you can ask the owner to put the animal outside, but the owner still should be able to get the service that your organization provides. So here's a video on wayfinding assistance. Um, I won't show it here, it's about nine minutes, but it's a, it's a good guide to show you how to grasp and ask and how to escort people at the top of stairs and bottom of stairs uh, if you need to provide that service. This is produced by the uh, Lighthouse for the Blind. Okay, let's talk about uh, let's talk about deaf or hard of hearing. Technology is important, but I'm sorry, terminology is important. Avoid the use of hearing impaired because that provides a connotation that something is wrong with the individual. So we we say deaf and hard of hearing. We don't say hearing impaired, uh, but use the phrase at the person identity first, how they want to identify themselves. Some individuals wear hearing aids, cochlear implants, which is a device that's installed on the back of a, a skull, or no assistive technology. A lot of loud and back, background noises make it hard to hear. And I just want to uh, talk about some myths. Deaf people do enjoy music. Deaf people, like I know deaf people who dance, DJ. Deaf people can drive. Um, <coughs> Some people who are deaf, hard of hearing, are good lip readers, others are not. Sign language is only 30% understood. So we would say to be 100% in your line of work, you may want to pass notes or ask yes or no questions. Um, so yeah, lip reading, you know, like sign language is not universal also. There's American sign language, there's French sign language, there's German sign language, there's different types of sign languages. So make sure that uh, you use American Sign Language. And if you have to get an interpreter, it's the responsibility of the organization that's hosting the event. Whenever you have a flyer invitation, you should put language that uh, lets, that provides an individual a way to request an interpreter or any accommodation that they may need, at least a week in advance so you can procure the services. So if you communicate with somebody that's deaf, or hard of hearing, please do not speak slow. We tend to speak slow or exaggerate our speech. That's not necessary. Don't over enunciate. If somebody's wearing a hearing aid, and if you start yelling at them, they're not going to understand what you're saying. Speak to them the same way you speak to them. Don't assume you have to speak up. Let them tell you to speak up. Uh, let them tell you to slow down. Don't make that assumption. Be flexible how you communicate. Like I said, pass notes, ask yes or no question, and don't pretend that you understand. Rephrase what you think they're saying. Uh, for accessibility for the deaf or hard of hearing would be captioning. Um, also, it would be captioning. So real-time captioning is where on like virtual meetings, you can turn that on before the meeting starts. Sometimes it's called live captioning or live transcription. And if you have a good quality mic, it will be able to type the words that are spoken. But the more accurate way to communicate with you would be to use computer aided real time transcription service, which is CART service, where it's someone that's like a court reporter, but it's a human that's typing everything they hear. And you can provide that, and that can be linked into the meeting. Uh, that occurs a lot on um, videos. You can have remote interpreters, remote um, transcribers. Another type of accessibility would be an assistive listening device. We have that at uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. If you're ever at the Petrillo Band Share, you can request that, which is amplified sound for people who have hearing loss. 
with the sound to amplify to a receiver or a uh, hearing aid. So accessibility benefits everyone. What this means is take the time to learn about the accessibility features of your facility, building, restaurant, organization, and company. Know if your accessibility features are in good working condition, that your uh, wheelchair accessible parking spaces are clearly earmarked, demarcated with signs, only 16 inches wide. You're, you have visual alarms in your building for people who are deaf or hard of hearing. You know where the accessibility, accessible restrooms are located, that they're in working order, that you're, you have lower counters that are at least 34 inches high. So people who are, are wheelchair users uh, have somebody on hand, a staff member, we're gonna talk about the access officers who knows how to procure accessibility service providers. You could call our office so we could pass along the list of service providers that we have and know how to get, also we have providers who provide braille and large print materials and on clear mass. People with mobility impairments, the terminology for not to use would be wheelchair bound. That means someone is bound and tied up. People who use wheelchairs are not bound to their wheelchair. Some people who use wheelchairs can walk. They can transfer in and out of their wheelchairs all the time. Sometimes they just use it if they're gonna need to travel long distances. And if you need to communicate with somebody who uses a wheelchair for a long, long period of time, sit down so you can be at that level. Um, you know, like, I, like we talked about earlier, Make sure that the accessibility features and the routes and the pickup drop-off areas for your event or facility are, are provided to the paratransit services or for your guests who may arrive. And the pickup and drop-off area is the closest place where someone can get picked up and dropped off to an event. Oh. Okay, I also want to talk about accessible physical spaces, like the, make sure that the lifts and the elevators are in good working condition. When it comes to accessible seating, I wanna talk about integrated seating. So don't segregate people with disabilities on one side. Then integrated seating means themselves, maybe you may take out a, a chair for a wheelchair space and two companions that can be inter, interspersed throughout the event area. So uh, let's talk about communicating with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. <coughs> Speak directly to the person. Don't, don't, do not make assumptions about their intelligent levels, no matter how they may sound to you. Someone could be 60 years old, but if they communicate like a child to you, don't assume you need to respond back to them like a child. So don't make their assum assumptions but it's good to use plain language, meaning don't use acronyms or uh, idioms or uh, jargon that's uh, specific to a type of bit. Just use everyday layman's language, make it plain so everyone can understand it. And then when you're communicating to someone, especially with somebody with developmental disability, provide sequential steps, you know, of what's gonna happen. We even provide social stories uh, where you use everyday language for people with developmental disabilities where you say, A is gonna happen, B is gonna happen, C is gonna happen, D is gonna happen. And you use like I language. You don't say you would do this, you say I would do this and I would do that. Uh, and provide one-on-one -on -one assistance in a relaxed environment. Relaxed environment means like a low sensory environment if you can, a nice quiet area where you can take time to answer questions. Because some, some people uh, can go through sensory overload with too much outside noise. Okay, online disability etiquette is pertinent because we have a, a online training right now. So like I said earlier, if you have an online event, provide a means 
for people to request an accommodation. Establish rules for participation, describe images and videos, and use plain language. Rules for, for participation is um, universal for all meetings. You know, you can have the Las Vegas rules where this is a safe space, what happens in here stays in here, or you can establish the rules where people need to slow down and read the chat. Um, and I think that's coming up on the next slide is provide an access check, an accessibility check, meaning if you know people in your audience have accessibility needs, make sure that they're in work, that they're working, that interpreters are on the screen, they are able to spotlight themselves, that the uh, person that uses the interpreter is able to see them, that the captioning is working, things of that nature. Yeah, and this is the access check, it means you may need to mute the microphone, demonstrate the accessibility features, and at the beginning of each meeting, what we do, we provide visual descriptions, we introduce ourselves the first time we uh, speak for people who are listening. And that's like a way without singling out people who are blind or visually impaired or, or low vision. You could say, well, I'm just providing this description for people who are listening. And also have somebody from your team monitor the chat and the question and answer feature. Uh, virtual meetings, we kind of provided this uh, information earlier but we like to reinforce it. As far as uh, have virtual meetings, if you want to share materials ahead of time and provide visual description, have somebody monitor the chat. Um, for in-person meetings, you follow the same, uh, you can follow the same rules because it could be someone that's blind in the in-person meeting. So you want to introduce yourself first time you speak, but learn about the accessible routes pick up and drop off area, pace, paratransit, or private vehicles. Uh, know, have somebody that knows how to procure accessibility service providers and identify or assign someone to provide materials in advance. <clears throat> so do you at your organization have somebody identified to provide accessibility related, related requests or questions? If not, then you need to provide somebody that has an accessibility role. At Chicago, the city of Chicago, we provided access officers, which is, I, I might have mentioned this earlier, people who are trained, they receive like five or six different trainings in different accessibilities. They have all the materials and lists on, of accessibility providers. They have an email and a telephone number that has access in the front of it. So whenever somebody from let's say the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, if they want to uh, request a, an interpreter or a program in Braille, they email this person and uh, this person will, even though it says access at Department of Cultural Affairs at cityofchicago.org, it will come to their email mailbox and they'll be able to read it and they'll be able to provide that uh, service or request for the accessibility needs. And so if you have any public facing program, any programs that are offered to the public, a visitor, contractor, a job applicant, any clients, uh, any meetings, community intake, interviews, anytime somebody from the outside is entering your facility, that's a public facing program. So I have a quiz, I would ask, what is the most appropriate term you should use to refer to a person with a disability? A, special, B, handicapped, C, handicapable, D, the person's name. I give you a five seconds to think about that. You know, special, we're all special, there's a special Olympic. We all know handicap is not the term you use. Also mentioned, don't use the R word, the retarded word, don't use that word at all. Handicapable, you're trying to be cute using handicapable, don't use that, don't use differently able, there's a lot of terms you can use, but the best term would be that person's name. And so I have some quizzes that I want you to take, and I guess since this is recorded, I want you to think about this and I'll read it to you. Think, 
about how you would solve this issue. Scott visited a local Chicago restaurant to service animal Sam. After he sits down, the restaurant owner approaches Scott and tells him that the restaurant has a no pet policy. Scott states that the animal is a service animal. The restaurant owner asks Scott to show paperwork for the dog. Scott does not have paperwork, so he is asked to leave. Later that day, Scott calls the city to report this issue. And this would be the Department of Human Relations, stating that the restaurant owner is out of compliance with, I should say, his business license. Did Scott violate the no pet policy? How would you handle this complaint? complaint? So, like we talked about before, and you can use the slides for reference, a service animal is not considered a pet, okay? Service animals can be individually trained. So, the best way, Scott did not violate the no pet policy, the restaurant owner violated the ADA, the civil rights of Scott. A customer by asking for paperwork and asking the owner, uh, the uh, guest, the patron to leave. So the best way you would handle this complaint is leave the person alone and let them sit down and enjoy themselves. You could ask them what is the animal used for, and is this used for a disability? Those two questions, but that's it. Like I said, you can observe the behavior of the animal if you're. If you want to, if you're wondering if it's a real service animal or not, and usually a service animal will sit underneath a chair, they get stepped on. You don't even know they're there. That's how a trained service animal behaves. <clears throat> and like I said, if the service animal is is kind of disruptive, then you can ask the person to let the service animal outside, but the, the person can still stay. So here's some testimonials. We uh, sent surveys out. We we're going to do this training to individuals um, to provide testimonials on customer service. So I'm just going to read some of them. Ideally, information about accessibility should be available to everyone. That means universal access. So like I said, the longer you live can greatly increase your chances for developing a disability. And I know a person's disability awareness is pretty much based on their personal experience. And so you cannot, I cannot, even people with disabilities who work at our office cannot personally experience over 200 different types of disability, disabilities. But if you provide as much accessibility as you can, it will serve, universally serve everyone. It will future-proof everyone. Uh, the next one is QR code was needed and a subsequent form needed to be completed. And as a result, the items had to be read verbally. Uh, I think I remember this, uh, this like QR codes are not accessible for people who are blind or have low vision. So in that case, you may have to have individual or staff read the menu items. <clears throat> I know some restaurants, the servers have to memorize the item. So just think about that. That's not anything that's written. Anything in one format, think about an alternative format. If something is spoken, then people who cannot hear need it written. If something is written, then people who cannot see need it spoken. So think about, always think about alternative formats. And the last testimonial is pointing instead of giving verbal directions. So someone asking for directions, like especially at Home Depot, if someone points, well, I shouldn't uh, point out Home Depot, any place, because I know Home Depot has a no pointing zone, but any organization or company and someone asks for directions, we say, do not just point. It could be a reason why someone is asking you an obvious question. At the Taste of Chicago, we talk to the vendors at the restaurant booths. And if someone asks you for the menu, we tell them, don't point at the menu item next to the ticket prices, because it could be a reason. They could be blind or have low vision. They could be dyslexic and can't read it. Uh, English could be a second language. So this read the information if possible. Someone asks you for your name, even if you have an ID on, don't point at your name tag, just give them your name. 
All right, so Q and A. This is what we talked about. Hopefully, you have some. This is just a starting point. <coughs> Awareness of disability. Hopefully, we gave you some knowledge of the ADA, specifically Title Three, public accommodation. Uh, hopefully, you had some aware. You received some awareness of how to communicate with people with varying disabilities, and how to gain awareness to develop an individual from an organization to address. Accessibility concerns that individual, they can come to our office, call our office. If they need any help at 312-744-4602. And on the slides, you were provided there's a link where you can sign up for disability awareness training. And actually, here's my um, information with the link. If you have any questions, my email address is J E R O D dot L O C K H A R T at city of Chicago dot org. Here's my phone number, area code 312 744 4602. And stay in touch with us. We're on Facebook at MOPD Chicago and Twitter, MOPD Chicago and Instagram. We also have a newsletter. We come out with a monthly newsletter and sometimes we have special features. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Jared, for giving us that great uh, information. Um, we are able to take that in and be better for it uh, and be able to approach situations and uh, materials and all other kinds of things that we do so that we are in compliance uh, with uh, ADA and uh, we are serving serving the people in our communities much better. So thank you so much for that. And for those of you that are listening to this uh, workshop, we will post uh, this um, PowerPoint online. Uh, you can find it at www chicago.gov backslash dps and just search for the title of this workshop and you will see this presentation also if you would like to go back and hear it live you will be able to do so in youtube at www.youtube.com backslash chicago DPS. And then once you get to the Chicago DPS landing page in YouTube, you will just uh, go to the uh, playlist for workshops for 2022. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. And we will definitely see you at the next or uh, participate with you at the next uh, presentation. Thank you. All right, have a good day.